Hi, this is Trev and welcome to my blog. Welcome to part 8 of my Bedford CA van restoration. In this part I'm going to discuss how I've converted the steering from steering box to steering rack. When manufacturers are designing a car, if the car is to be rear wheel drive then they will normally mount the rack at the front of the axle. This is because of the restricted space needed for a rack with the engine and gearbox in the way. If the car is front wheel drive then they will normally fit the rack behind the engine or up on the bulkhead. So my initial plans were to fit the rack at the front of the axle. I decided to fit the Focus steering rack from my donor car. I discussed this with my friend Steve and he said to me, you have thought about bump steer haven't you? And I hadn't considered this. And I must admit my knowledge was pretty poor at the time. So I made some temporary mountings and mounted the rack to the front of the axle. I had to cut the tie rod ends and re-weld them to make them shorter because they were too long. I managed to get the rack fitted and eliminate the bump steer. Shortly after this I was looking through an original Bedford CA manual and I stumbled upon a section in the steering that uh, told you about the angles of degrees that the wheels needed to be on a 20 degree lock. So what it says in the manual is if you were turning around a right hand bend the left wheel set to 20 degrees the right wheel should then be at 20 and a half degrees to 22 and a half degrees so the inside wheel needs to be turning at a tighter angle than the outside wheel on a lock so I borrowed some turn plates off a friend of mine that have angles of degrees set on the turn plates. I lowered the car onto the turn plates and I set the left wheel to 20 degrees and to my horror the right wheel was measuring at 17. It took me a while to work it out but by swapping the steering arms from left to right had indeed reversed the Ackerman angle. The other problem that I had was when you look at the Bedford CA axle, it's very heavily curved and also the lower wishbones are set right back. Now when you fit the rack at the front it means that the tie rods on the rack will be raked right back. This is a tie rod for modern steering rack. If you imagine the angle raked back you've got far less movement in the rod now than if you had it set straight. That's straight and that's raked back so you can see how easily you could bend one of these if you had it raked too far back. And this is another problem with doing this on the CA. So now faced with the reality of not being able to fit the rack in front of the axle and have an extremely restricted space around the gearbox I had to set about doing a ton of research and get me thinking hat on and think a way out of my problem. I studied the geometry on the van and I worked out a plan of action. Now there's lots of different components to steering and a few of the things I could rule out personally because this is a blog, this isn't really a how to, this is how I've got over this problem and I've done this blog just to help other people out really these are the problems I've been faced with if they can help you out then that's really what it's all about. So faced with this knowledge that I now had I had to work out a plan of how I could get a rack to fit in behind. Now the various components to do with steering uh, caster angle, camber, tracking these three can be eliminated really from from my my issues because 
I was keeping the axle completely unmolested. The steering arms have been returned to the old position. So really there was no other issues I had to contend with. It was just the fitment of the rack and the positioning of the rack and the correct rack width that I needed to establish. The first obstacle to get past was going to be the issue of bump steer. In this diagram we will assume that we are looking at the front axle from behind. So this side here is the left hand side or the passenger side. I use this formulation to assess the correct rack width fitment needed for the Bedford CA. Before we start our formulation you must first be aware that the track rod end bolts to the steering arm here. This then dictates that distance between the tie rod and the lower wishbone. The inner tie rod and the lower wishbone must run parallel to each other for the system to work. You will notice two red lines on the diagram, both sides. These run through the pivot points on the upper wishbone and the lower wishbone. The inner tie rod board joint must fall on this line both sides. The distance between the pivot points on the lower wishbones are 53 centimeters from here to here and our rack width from bore joint to bore joint is 55 centimeters which is more or less spot on keeping this inner tie rod parallel with the lower wishbone. Okay so my final choice for the steering rack was a Corsa B powered steering rack. This steering rack is also fitted on the Tigra A and the Combo Van. And what I like about the fact that it's fitted to the Combo Van is it must be man enough for the job. And the Combo Van has got a combined weight, a uh, gross weight of 2,350 kilograms. Here's the rack in place. I've just tacked it into place for now because I've got to check for bump steer before I weld it in permanently. As you can see, I've got a nice parallel line between the tie rod and the lower wishbone. I've also had to do some pretty drastic measures to get the rack where it is. I've taken away a big section of the aluminium sump. Um, it's only spare sump. There's no oil in it or anything like that. It's just a bit of strengthening webbing. Um, also the sumps had to be thrown away, the sump that I made, because the rack's in the way of the sump. I've bought a cheap aftermarket sump, brand new, it only cost me about £20, so I thought I'd better just scrap the old one and make a new one from a brand new item. Also, I've got the starter motor, if you can just about see it. That's the correct starter motor for the conversion now. And I've bought that and got it fitted in there so I could make sure that everything fits in around it. And although I've got enough space everywhere, the tolerances are extremely tight. But hey, it's in there, so um, I'm going to check for bump steer now. This is what I did to initially check for bump steer when I first fitted the steering rack. Got the rack tacked in place and I've got the track rod end attached to the steering arm. I've got the coil spring removed and also the bump stops removed. This is so that the suspension can go through its full range of travel. With the coil spring removed, obviously I can just move it up and down by hand. And you can actually feel quite slight amounts of bump steer just by holding the drum with both hands. You can actually feel it trying to pull one way and the other. Um, and this is how I initially started because there's no point getting too technical at this stage because you want to get it somewhere near and then just by moving the rack up or down by say a millimetre actually does make quite a big difference so to get past all that endless check measure check measure I find it easy just to do it by hand because you can actually like I say you can actually feel just the slightest variation by hand and you can actually see it initially when I first started lifting the uh, drum up down you can actually see it moving like that because it's just so far out. So this was the final stage of how I set up the car to eradicate bump steer. 
I've got this little laser pointer and um, very high tech piece of blue tack on the back. I just attach it to the drum like so. And then this casts a dot on the wall that's approximately six feet away. The beauty in this method lies in the fact that the slightest movement on this drum means that you get huge movements on the wall. In fact, if the drum swivels by one millimetre, you get 55 millimetres of movement on the wall. So this means that when you end up with a graph that looks something like this, the distance between here is actually only a movement on the wheel of 2.36 millimetres. With the laser beam on and a jack under the lower wishbone, I can now start. If I raise and lower the suspension, the laser throws out a nice beam onto the paper. I can use this beam to plot out a nice graph uh, that will show me exactly where the suspension is pointing. I'll start our point of reference right at the bottom. So I'll draw a little dot with a pencil. Then I do a dot to dot. And this is our first line. This is with the rack connected. And this gives us our first line. This is the line that the suspension is now taking with the rack connected. I let the jack down. Now I'm going to disconnect the track rod end and we'll do it again. Okay, spot on results. Um, the bump stop starts about here. That's the uh, large bump stop at the on the lower wishbone. The top bump stop would be about here. So the suspension is travelling through its full range and I would have said that normal driving range would be somewhere from about sort of here to here so that's really the main point of interest is here but I've taken it taken the bump stops off so we've, we've got the full range of motion anyway because I like to make it look as bad as possible to try and get it as good as possible and this to, as far as I'm concerned this is an excellent result. Now, taking our formula into account, if I measured the distance from there to there, that is the absolute most amount of travel. And that, to my eye, looks around about five, six millimetres. Now, if you divide this by 55, that gives you the true representation of the bump steer. And this is out of the range of the normal travel because like I said if you're at this line here you'd actually be hitting the bump stop and unless you're traveling across ploughed fields or something um, then it's not going to be an issue is it this was the first graph that I did when I initially installed the rack remember I said about the um, the exaggeration this is actually only 2.36 millimeters out at the wheel itself but because it's six foot from the wall and any movement is greatly exaggerated it's given us this kind of pattern uh, this line was with no rack so this is following the natural the natural arc of the wishbones and then when I
attached the steering rack. The steering rack was pulling the steering round by this much. So you can see how much it was affecting it by. Interestingly, I could actually detect this this very slight uh, movement by hand. So you, your hands are actually quite sensitive. Then um, I felt that the rack was in too low a position and this is why I was getting this result. So right. I used the rack. Only by about 10 millimeters and I'd overdone it. As you can see, I've moved, I've moved this line this side. If we look at this other graph, then it's bent right back round, so crossed over. Now this isn't far away, and I tweaked the uh, rack um, down again, but only by about half a millimetre to a millimetre each time, until I ended up with our final set of results, which I'm very pleased with. The other big issue I had was the fact that the coarser track rod ends don't fit the steering arms on the Bedford CA. In fact, they are hopelessly too small. Now, I searched for a long time trying many, many different track rod ends. And in fact, what I did is I took my steering arm off and I went hunting round for, at various places for different track rod ends. And I managed to come up trumps actually. I fell right on my feet because I found that off a Rover 200, a 1991, but I believe they fitted them on all the models. These track rod ends, an absolute perfect fit for the steering arms. And the Rover 200 inner tie rods have got the same thread as the Corsa rack. So I've managed to wind the inner track rod ends straight into the Corsa rack and they didn't even need cutting down. So with bump steer completely eliminated, all that was left was then to drop the car back on its wheels and check for angles of degrees, the Ackerman effect. Got the van back on its wheels now. I'm just checking for angles of degrees on two out and I've got 20 degrees on the driver's side and 20 and a half ish on the passenger side. If I step it up to 25 degrees on the driver's side, then I'm getting a whole extra degree on the passenger side. So the readings are just within the manufacturer's specifications. I'd like it to have been a little bit better than this, but I've got odd sized tires. I've set the tracking with a tape measure and there's no load in the vehicle whatsoever. It's actually on its bump stop still. If I need to increase the Ackerman when the vehicle's on the road, I've got a spare set of arms, I could just tweak them in lightly and that will increase the Ackerman effect. But I think it's worth setting the vehicle up properly now, get it on the road, driving it and just see how it drives. I'll soon know if it's scrubbing the tires going around the corners. I think that's enough information for this part, catch me in the next part where I'll be building a steering column and attaching the steering column to the rack.